The purpose of today's lab is to find the index of refraction of a piece of glass, phrased in the form of a question, as we always phrase the problem, what is the index of refraction of glass? Now, the materials are going to become obvious to you as we discuss the procedure, as are the variables. Just remind you that there's going to be one manipulated variable, one responding variable, and then there's going to be, well, essentially an infinite number of control variables, but as always, we expect you to list the important one or important ones of the, the control variables. Everything that must stay the same, otherwise it would royally mess everything up. So we'll say times whatever, whatever it is that you need to completely uh, describe this. Now, this is what this activity is going to look like. You're going to have, everybody's going to have, a piece of paper with this uh, cross on it, like this. Now, on that cross, you're going to place a glass block. You've got to make sure that you place it perfectly so that that glass block goes right along one of the lines on that cross. Does that make sense? It's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. Now, you're going to shine a laser into that glass block. You're going to shine it so that it enters that glass block right at the intersection of that cross. That's critical. It needs to enter right at the intersection of the, of the uh, cross there. Now, you can move the laser around any way you want in order to make that happen. It's easy to make happen. You just have to be conscious of the fact that it needs to enter at that spot. Now, what I want you to do at this point is to take a pen or a pencil or whatever, however you're going to mark it, and mark where the laser beam leaves the laser. Do it right as close to the laser as you can. So, in other words, I don't want you to put a mark right here, not close enough. Okay, I want you to put a mark as close to the laser itself as you can, indicating where the laser beam leaves the laser. Do the same thing on the other side of the glass, that is where the laser beam leaves the piece of glass. Now, with my diagram right here, you can't see where the laser beam leaves the piece of glass, but when you're doing this activity, you will. Notice, you don't see the laser beam itself, because the laser beam is not reflecting off of anything as it moves through the air. But when it hits the piece of glass, you'll see it, because it reflects off of the glass, and when it leaves the glass, you'll see it because it reflects off of the glass. Does that make sense? So you've got two dots that you're going to make. A little dot right here, okay, a little dot right here, and then this little dot that I've drawn right here, you don't need to draw that because it's already marked for you, and that's where the two lines intersect. You're going to repeat that ten times, basically, ten times with ten different angles as they approach this uh, this boundary of air versus glass. Now, if you look closer at it on the left-hand side here, you can see, looking from above, minus the glass, this would be the point that I drew where it left the laser, this would be the point where it left the glass, and then this point right here, of course, is the point where the two lines intersect. That's the point where the laser beam entered the glass. I want you to take a ruler at this point, and I want you to connect those two dots. And then I want you to take a ruler and connect these two dots. And then I want you to measure two things. We call it the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. Remember we talked about refraction yesterday, the amount of bending of light or of any kind of wave that takes place? The angle of refraction is the angle at which the light enters. Um, so the angle of refraction is the, the angle at which it bends. The angle of incidence is the angle at which it enters. This is what we're going to call theta i, the angle of incidence, or theta 1. It's measured from, notice this line right here is drawn at 90 degrees. We call that a normal line. That angle is measured from the normal line, which is a 90 degree line to the boundary between the glass and the air. It's drawn from the normal line to the red incident line. Theta 2, the angle of refraction, is going to be measured right here from the normal line to the angle at which it leaves. Does that make sense? Notice that theta 1 is bigger than theta 2. In your activity, theta 1, every single trial, will be bigger than theta 2. Now, that doesn't have to be the case. If you were going from glass to air, then theta 1 would be smaller than theta 2. But going from air to glass, theta 1 will always be bigger than theta 2. The reason for that, and you'll see why a little bit more detail tomorrow, but the reason for that is fundamentally because when light goes from air to glass, it slows down. And when it slows down, that causes the angle to decrease. 
theta 2, therefore smaller than theta 1. Now, how do we measure those angles? Well, with a protractor. But some of us forget how to use a protractor since we used them last in grade 7 or whatever it was that we used protractors. In 23 years of diploma exams, I've gone through 23 years of diploma exams, last semester was the first time ever they required you to use a protractor on the diploma exam. You needed to use a protractor on the diploma exam. We were ready for it. We had protractors sitting at the back of the room so that people could use them if they needed it, but we didn't expect it because it had never happened before. Um, some people, because we didn't expect it, didn't really pay too much attention to using a protractor, to knowing how to use a protractor. It, it's happened, so now it might happen again. Make sure that you can measure these angles with a protractor. This would be, this would be the block here. Of course, we've taken the block away, though, right? This would be, right here, our angle of incidence. So if you want to measure that angle of incidence, make sure you put the bottom line of the protractor okay, along that normal line. And make sure you put that horizontal line along that boundary line right here. Such that there's going to be a little spot of intersection right there in the protractor. Make sure you place it at the intersection point of your lines. Now, take a look at this and tell me what the angle would be. The angle of incidence right here. Looks like 40, 41, 42, 3, 4, 5, 6, looks like 47. You're going to round that to the nearest half of, is that wrong? No, I just saw, okay, maybe it was something else. Um, it's 47 degrees, okay? We want to measure that to the nearest half of a degree if possible. So in other words, if it's 47 and a bit, decide whether it's closer to 47 or 47 and a half. Does that make sense? Don't go any... Don't go any higher degree of precision than that. Don't say, oh, I think that's 47.2. You're not good enough to do that. Okay, it's either 47 or it's 47.5. In this case, it would be 47. I'm not saying you're not good enough because you're not smart enough. None of us are good enough to, to express it to a higher degree of precision than that. This is one of the rules of measurement. So 47 degrees, we'd label that. And then we'd do the same thing over here and measure this theta 2. Remember, theta 2 will be smaller in every case for your lab today than theta 1. So maybe it's 40 degrees. I don't know what it's going to work out to be. You, do, you measure it the way it's supposed to be measured and get what you get. Medium 1, by the way, air. What's medium 2? Glass, yeah. And the index of refraction, remember we talked yesterday about the index of refraction? What's the smallest possible index of refraction? What is it? Yes, it's 1. The index of refraction of a, of a vacuum and of air is 1. So we're going to say the index of refraction of air is 1, and ultimately we're going to try to find the index of refraction of the glass. All right? Once we have our data table, which is theta 1 and theta 2, then we're going to create another table, an analysis table, which is sine theta 1 and sine theta 2. And literally, all you've got to do to complete this table is take your angle and type on your calculator sine whatever that angle is, and get a value for it. It's going to be a decimal number. You're going to fill it in right here, and so on, 10 times. Then you're going to plot a graph. What's your graph going to be? Not theta 1 and theta 2. That was your data table. Sometimes we plot our data table. This time, we don't, because we have an analysis table, which is sine theta 1 and sine theta 2. My y-axis will be sine theta 2. My x-axis will be sine theta 1. It's always the second column versus the third, sorry, versus the first column. Now, what do you think I'm going to get for a shape of this? Take a guess. It's going to be a straight line. It's going to be a straight line. And we represent a straight line, any straight line graph, by what equation? Y equals mx plus b. Good. Now, let's sub in a value or an expression for y here. What do we get? Sine theta 2. Good. M is slope. Yeah, you guys are getting better at this. Good. X is what? Sine theta 1. Good. B is? B is the y-intercept, and it's once again going to be 0. The next lab we do, the y-intercept will not be 0. So it's not always 0. It usually is, but not always 0. Okay, next time it won't be. This time it is, so we'll cross it off. Now, what equation on our data sheet has sine theta 2 and sine theta 1? Well, it's the Snell's law equation that we just learned, right? Sine theta 1 
over sine theta 2 equals n2 over n1. There's other variables in between there, but we're going to pick the two parts of that equation that seem relevant to this lab. We don't want to say sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equals v1 over v2. If we wanted to find the value of v2, then that's what we do. But since we're looking for the value of n2, then we're going to set sine theta 1 over sine theta 2 equal to n2 over n1. Let's rearrange this to solve for the same variable as we have over here. The sine theta 2 has to go up to the top, n1 goes up to the top, and 2 goes down, and I end up with sine theta 2 is equal to n1 over n2 times sine theta 1. It takes the same form as the equation that came from the graph. We always want that, right? Always. Now let's cross off things that appear in both, as we always do. And what are we left with? The slope on one side is equal to what on the other side? n1 over n2. Google Sheets will tell you what the slope of the graph is, or you could punch it into your calculator, I suppose, if you wanted to. n1, we know what n1 is, right? We wrote that down in our data table a minute ago. It's 1.00. We know what n1 is. We're solving for n2. That's the index of refraction of the glass. It will be a number for sure bigger than 1 because 1.00 is the smallest index you can have. That's for a vacuum or for air. From that, the speed of light must decrease. Therefore, the index of refraction must increase as speed goes down and goes up. You should get a number that's somewhere in that range of 1.5, although it's not going to be perfect, most likely. So solve for the value of n2, then draw a conclusion. The conclusion is usually two sentences. The index of refraction is blank. And by the way, there are no units associated with this because of the way we defined index of refraction yesterday. It's a ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the medium. Speed divided by speed, the units end up canceling out. So there are no units, it's just a number. The index of refraction is blank and you know this because Just explain briefly, explain how you figured out what the index of refraction was. Then you want to have two or three good sources of air. Don't forget those suggestions for improvement. Now we do have just a couple little safety notes here. Because we're dealing with lasers, albeit low-powered lasers, we are dealing with lasers which have the potential to damage the eye. Now these are low enough power that um, even if they flash across your eye quickly, they will not cause damage. But if they're exposed to your eye for an extended period of time, I don't mean like five minutes, but I mean like seconds, if they're exposed to the eye, then they could do some damage. So we have a couple of rules here uh, that, that prevent us from doing damage to our eyes here, or anybody else's eyes. Firstly, when you turn on a laser, do not, oops, wrong way here, do not point it at the ceiling, do not point it at the back wall, don't point it anywhere except down. Got it? Point it down if you're testing it. Point it down towards the floor. Not horizontal, not up when you're testing it. Now, when you're actually going to do your activity, you're going to need to, to have it go horizontal, right? So you're going to put it on the desk, then turn it on. Okay, don't turn it on and then put it on the desk. Put it on the desk and then turn it on. And make sure that if you lift it, it's off before you lift it. It needs to point horizontal when it's on your desk, or any other time, it needs to point straight down. Finally, um, the person that's got the laser is doing their part in keeping everybody's eyes safe. You have to do your part as well in keeping your own eyes safe. And to, in order to accomplish that, you need to make sure that you do not kneel down so that your head is not at desk level ever. That your, desk ha your, your head has to be at the level it is right now, standing up basically so that it's above the level of lasers. Does that make sense? All right, so what do you got to hand in for this? Well, it's always outlined on Google Classroom, but you need a problem, which I already gave you, the materials, which are going to be very straightforward once you look at this stuff, um, the variables, manipulated responding, and then a, one or two control variables, depending upon how many are really important, your data, theta 1, theta 2, your analysis, sine theta 1, sine theta 2, and your graph, your conclusion, and then two or three really good sources of error and suggestions for improvement.